Uh, the next session, we're going to return to the sessions that we have lined up and uh, continuing the uh, structure of sort of going globally down to more local. So we're going to go back global again. And the next session is focused on global preparedness and collaboration, moderated by Sheta Chakraborty. Sheta is a risk and behavioral scientist working at the forefront of climate action, including at the, at the present including as the president of U.S. operations for We Don't Have Time, which is Greta Thunberg's organization. Sheta uh, pursued her BS in decision science at Carnegie Mellon, Uni Mellon University and ultimately received her PhD in risk management from King's College, London. Sheta then went on to complete a postdoctorate at Oxford University and worked as an adjunct professor at Columbia University. So Sheta, if you're with us, the uh, floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much for hosting this incredible day of really important critical conversations around national security and climate change. And we're really excited to get into the second half of the day, which is focusing on solutions and particularly this panel on global pre preparedness and collaboration. So we know that climate change is becoming one of the world's most critical national security issues of the 21st century. And we're no longer discussing why but rather how we're going to address this through global preparedness and collaboration. So this panel in particular will examine how the climate crisis is set to change everything and what that means for our global collective action. I'm your moderator, as was just introduced. I am Dr. Shatha Chakraborty. I'm a risk and behavioral scientist applying science and communication science to the public to actually communicate in a way that we know is robust and effective. You may have seen me in global news media like CNN and the BBC discussing how climate change amplifies disasters like hurricanes and infectious diseases. But unfortunately, still lesser known is how the climate and national security communities here in the United States and globally think about collaboration on and mitigating against climate change. As we've heard throughout the course of today, climate change is a threat multiplier. It intensifies existing conflicts and it puts human and national global security at risk. This session's esteemed panelists will now contribute their expertise to exploring solutions on how we will globally prepare and cooperate. I would like to ask audience members to please get your questions in early. We are going to, I will introduce each of the panelists and ask them a few questions each, and then we will open it up for audience Q&A. So we'll save about 15 minutes for it. So please do put your questions into the chat box and I'll be keeping an eye and I will do my best to get to your questions at the end of this session. So our panelists today, I'm very excited to introduce. First, Vice Admiral Ben Beckering. Ben Beckering is retired from the Royal Netherlands Navy just recently, 2019, after 40 years of what he describes as intense and rewarding service. He served in his juniors, junior years, mostly in the frigates in various roles. During the second part of his career, he rotated between command positions at sea and staff positions on shore. He participated in a number of maritime security operations in the two decades that followed the Cold War. He was deployed to the waters around Somalia twice, conducting counter piracy operations. After a tour as deputy commander of the Navy, he concluded his military career in Brussels, serving as the Netherlands permanent military representative to NATO and the EU from 2016 to 2019. So we're really thrilled to have Ben Beckering with us here today. In his recent years, he's shared his experiences in the field of security and defense, and is now applying that experience to focusing on new security challenges like cyber and climate change and how they impact the wider world of security and defense. Very apropos for today's panel. Ben has way too many roles and accolades to name, but I know we'll be getting into some of this throughout this discussion. It'll become evident. Next, we have Cheryl Durant. Cheryl has over 30 years experience in the national security sector, including specialist army intelligence and defense capability and preparedness roles. In her former role as director of preparedness and mobilization in the Department of Defense, Cheryl led major defense initiatives into climate change and energy sustainability, and even commissioned the first major review of defense mobilization since Vietnam including supporting studies into global supply chain vulnerability and cyber war. Since leaving defense in 2020, Cheryl has undertaken research and public advocacy on the nexus between climate change, planetary security, and resilience. Cheryl Duran is currently an executive member of the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group 
and is an adjunct associate professor at the University of New South Wales. Thank you for being with us here today, Cheryl. And finally, we have Jane Nielsen. Jane Nielsen is a senior analyst in the policy branch of the New Zealand Ministry of Defense. Her primary policy focus is on the security and defense impacts of climate change in the South Pacific. Jane officially joined the ministry in December 2018 after completing 14 months in the role on secondment from the New Zealand Defense Force. During her time with the ministry, Jane played a leading role in the production of the 2018 Defense Assessment, the Climate Crisis, Defense Readiness and Responsibilities, and the follow-on November 2019 Implementation Plan, Responding to the Climate Crisis. A key part of her role is providing defense policy mentoring to Pacific Island counterparts. We're also thrilled to have you and your really relevant expertise for this panel. Thank you for joining us, Jane. So we're gonna get right into it. Time usually flies when we're talking about topics that we have years and years of collective experience on. And we'll start with you, Ben. So it's become really clear, especially in the second half of today's conference, that we it's not really about why we need to prepare globally and to collaborate, but rather how, how are we going to do this? Can you provide some open, opening thoughts for us today, please, from your vantage point? Ben, you are actually muted. If you don't mind, please just unmuting bottom left. That's a classic mistake, isn't it? Thanks very much for your kind introduction. And also thanks to the uh, organizers for having me on this uh, panel. Uh, and I totally agree. It's not so much why as how. And, and this morning, uh, we already heard lots of uh, good uh, suggestions on how we can do that. Um, and in fact, I would almost say in this global panel that perhaps the title should rather be Global Collaboration in preparation of whatever we need to do. Um, and, and notwithstanding the many local and regional um, initiatives that I've heard so far, and they're all extremely important, I do believe that we must have a, a global look. Uh, and that is a conclusion I made after two tours of the coast of Somalia and, and three years in, in NATO and EU's uh, conference rooms discussing the many challenges that we face. Uh, and and let, allow me to, to quickly go back to Somalia, my happy days at sea. Um, I was, I was, we were trying to, to keep the pirates there, anti-piracy operation, on the coast. So we needed to gain the support of the local people. Not only did they give me the support, uh, but they also explained to me uh, what the struggles were they were facing in that region. Um, and they were talking about uh, a very weak governance in, in Somalia, which did not have any opportunity to look after the safety of the people. They had uh, regional actors nearby, uh, uh, starting proxy wars. They had criminal and extremist organizations running around the villages, living off the people against their will. Uh, and they also complained about a not so consistent Western approach to the region. Um, but what struck me there most is that with all these issues they had, there was one big thing um, they wanted to bring across to me. And they were asking me, where can we go for help? And it was they, did, they didn't mention climate change because they didn't really comprehend climate change as such. But they said, we have, uh, we have silting wells. The waters in the Gulf of Aden are becoming 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and therefore the fish is fleeing. Um, and we have a changing monsoon pattern, which is destroying the few crops that we have here. So, so their, their question was, fine with all your pirates and fine with all the issues there are in the world but our, our, um, our area is becoming uninhabitable. Where can we go? Um, and then I moved to Brussels three years in those conference rooms, and we're discussing all the, 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 the big security issues. Um, but what I noticed there, uh, with all the good intentions, uh, there were still a lot of national interests being forged together as a compromise, but not giving a real solution to the questions the people in Somalia had asked me. Where can we go to come up? And, and I think, uh, what we see now is that um, uh, we, we, in many regions, not just the Horn of Africa, but also the Sahel and many other places, what we see um, in instable regions is that we have very opportunistic uh, global actors uh, who are looking to, to create their influence, perhaps looking for uh, resources. We have a, a, a Western group that is perhaps not so unified as they believe they are, 
we have non-state actors like terrorism and extremists, and they all zoom in on these unstable regions for whatever reason. Uh, and what we need really is a rules-based international order to, to tackle those, those sincere problems. Uh, and in, but what I, what I do see is that there's lacking a bit, that the support for this rules-based international order, which should be the start to tackle these problems, these global problems, is not seen. So we come into a spiral of climate change effects, more instability, people being drawn into the instability, uh, strategic competition rising, therefore short-term uh, horizon, which isn't good for uh, the, the long-term measures that we have to take for climate change. So what I sincerely believe in is that we need an integrated, comprehensive, global approach to the, the, to the, the issues that we see. And we need to start in those unstable regions in all phases of crisis, at all levels, with all actors involved, uh, using all instruments of power, and that includes the military instruments of power. Thank you, Ben, for sharing that, um, sharing your thoughts from your, your wealth of experience on the front lines. And uh, we will come back to you with many more questions. Let's move to Cheryl, who also from her experience can talk to the audience a little bit of when and how climate took a priority for her, and more broadly, as a top security threat. So Cheryl, what are the relationships to other security issues that you see between uh, climate change and things like food and water and peace, et cetera? Please share your thoughts with us. Thank you, and, and thanks to Nathan and the team for uh, having me here on the panel today. And I'm joining you from Palawa land in Tasmania, Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I think it is a journey for many in the military, and you, you heard in this morning's panel, the military has been looking at this for, for decades. I started looking at this in, in 2009. And when I first started looking at climate change, it, it sort of, I was looking at it through a national security lens. It was one of many threats we were looking at. But it soon became clear to me as I, I went along this journey and understood more about it and listened. So Admiral Titley, yes, the first L of Lama, I listened to what scientists were saying. I listened to people in other security communities, environmental security communities, food security communities, uh, water security, energy security. There's a lot of securities out there. And each of them had a, a story to tell about climate change. So what it became clear to me very soon was climate change was very different from other security threats that we're facing. And thus it needed different solutions and different thinking. And I've always said when I was in the military preparedness that the, the real first step of preparedness is actually understand the challenge you're facing. And the second step is, is really put all of your options on the table. I think we heard from Chris before in the immediate session, what positive thinking and exploring all the options can bring to a solution. But you, you don't want to close off those options early by thinking too narrowly about the problem. So just a little bit recap about why climate change is, is perhaps a different security threat from other security threats. Well, I think first and foremost, it's an existential risk to humanity. So just, just process that. If, if we don't do anything, if we, we just sort of let this thing flow unchecked, the very worst case is that global civilization itself might be threatened and fall. So probably we don't want to choose that path. So we've got choice. We still have choice now. But not only is it an existential risk itself, and from a security perspective, it's, that's sort of up there with nuclear war. Um, so it's, it's a biggie. But climate change also makes everything else with security in it a little bit more worse. We heard from this morning's session that climate change impacts on food and water security. So it affects the ability of communities to stay where they are and, and do what they've been doing for hundreds of thousands of years or is, is basically live and have a life that they're happy with and they have you know future for their family. And so climate change is impacting at that very basic level on, on communities through the changes that weather and heat are making into food and agricultural and water systems. We heard a bit about that too. But then it flows on further because if you're struggling to make ends meet, if you can't stay in place, it starts to have economic impacts as well and social impacts. And you might not be able to stay in place, so you're going to move. And we've seen how movements of people away from the Sahel in Africa have destabilised uh, some of the countries in Europe. So the longer you leave climate change unchecked, the more it starts playing out onto other risks to uh, the way we live and, and what we want to achieve in the future. And even you know COVID-19, which we've all been experiencing and, and working through 
the last sort of over a year now and, and continue to work through. Climate change changes patterns of disease. And so it sort of even impacts upon that. It just impacts everything and it's everywhere. And so in that sense, for me, a cat sort of epiphany, it, it requires new thinking and national security thinking just won't cut it because national security thinking's sort of bounded in the nation as, as the key thing. It's about protecting ourselves as a nation and it's normally threats come from other nations or through nations or are two nations. But climate change is really at a, a planetary level, at a global level. And so it requires us to, to look out, if you like, and, and think a bit more broadly. And we're not going to solve this solve this ourselves. We have to actually do this in a global way. So just like to sort of start when we, before I go into solutions, sort of characterise the problem as a, a global problem requiring global solutions. And we've heard the collaboration word a lot, and we've heard from just Ben before. And I think that's the, that second bit is really key to this panel's discussion is the collaboration. So more on that later. Thanks. Absolutely. We'll definitely be getting into that. Thank you, Cheryl. Jane, on to you. Please, from your vantage point and from your unique experiences in New Zealand and beyond, please describe to us what global preparedness and collaboration means to you. Tēnā koutou, katoa, ko Jane, taku ingoa. Hello, everybody. My name is Jane, um, and I would like to thank the organisers for convening this panel. I think it's very fitting that um, they we have managed to connect um, myself from New Zealand, Cheryl from Australia, and Ben from the Netherlands. Perhaps one of the last times we may have all been in the same room was possibly in the Netherlands at the Planetary Security Forum. Um, back before COVID-19, back then showing the real strength of, of global collaboration um, at an in-person scale. Um, of course, we've all had to adapt since that moment. Um, today, I'd like to share with you at the high level sort of the journey New Zealand's Ministry of Defence has been on on climate change in recent years. And to contextualise that, I'd like to bring you back to the 2018 Pacific Islands Forum meeting at that meeting, regional leaders, including New Zealand, affirmed that climate change presents the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security, and well-being of Pacific peoples. And as you've already heard in this panel, the effects of climate change, and in particular in the Pacific region um, alone, and the future intensity increases that are predicted um, demonstrate the real importance of this declaration um, and work that sits under it to do better. Um, so in New Zealand in 2018, our um, government of the time released a strategic defence policy statement that put climate change at the centre um, alongside tr more traditional security threats um, such as cyber and space, um, alongside transnational organised crime, for example. This showed that how climate change had, had not necessarily been given a centre stage in past documents. Um, the science was becoming so clear and the regional impacts as well were becoming so clear that it was actually recognised alongside these more traditional security impacts. This led New Zealand into working on the 2018 climate change defence assessment um, called the Climate Crisis, Defence Readiness and Responsibilities. This document really was trying to actually deep dive into how is climate change impacting the security and stability um, and well-being of the Pacific? Um, and how does, for example, climate change impacts on Antarctica also impact the region down track in terms of sea level rise but also the movement of fish stocks, which will impact communities and their well-being. This document, we um, at the end made a whole range of recommendations to make sure that um, our defence force and our Ministry of Defence collectively improved our work um, on climate change. And this was um, published, the next document, apologies, was published in 2019, an implementation plan on these, doc on these recommendations. The plan allows us to outline the work that was actually collectively already happening across the two organisations. And I, I recommend to other governments, departments around the world starting to embark on climate change to do, do a first initial stock take 
on what climate change work is already occurring. And you might be surprised. Um, it might be more than you think. Um, and then the process we went through was going through what we would like to achieve in the near term and then what we would like to achieve going further down track. Um, so now that we're about a year and a half into this plan, COVID-19 is thrown in a small spanner, um, but work is underway and it has really set us on the path um, to doing more in the future, um, albeit having to be a bit more creative, um, perhaps with virtual Zooms um, to share information with each other, such as this one. Um, I'll leave it with there, there Shetta, thank you. Thank you, Jane. And you just made me nostalgic for that wonderful meeting that we were all at in uh, pre-COVID in The Hague, the Planetary Security Initiative. And it was there that we talked about the evolving role of NATO and of course the launch of the IMCCS, International Military Council on Climate and Security. And so there's a lot of opportunity here for the military to not necessarily pivot, but to pivot where necessary and to also evolve. And with that, I'd love to get Ben's thoughts on really the role of the military. What is the evolving role within countries and more uh, collaboratively around the world to contribute to these climate challenges that we're facing as a global collective? Ben, would love your thoughts on that. Yep. Uh, now I switched it on. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I think the military can contribute in, in, a, in a major way. And uh, like anybody else have to contribute and, and certainly I don't claim that climate issues are a military problem with a military solution. We are just one of the military is one of the players that is there that is out there. Uh, but if I if you allow me to highlight what I feel are three very relevant um, uh, 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 items where the military can contribute to an overall effort and is first I would say that our, uh, the military intelligence um, apparatus, it, which every military organization has, and who are looking at uh, unstable regions where their troops may have to operate, um, they, they could uh, look at uh, the, the, the root causes of conflict, including climate change, put that in their intelligence reports, and make sure that it becomes more uh, of, an, of a document that they can share. And, and in doing so, I honestly believe they can contribute to what I experience as a very polarized climate debate in our nations um, between the deniers and the fundamentalists, so to say. And I think if you add sort of uh, professional, as objective as possible, uh, intelligence reports to the debate, um, making a clear link with the security issues that come from uh, climate change, uh, also, when they're being exported to our own region through migration or through export of extremism, you can contribute to that debate. But th the second thing is that uh, I think what the military should do is prepare themselves for new types of operations. Um, uh, have a look at what climate change will do. To give you uh, an example, in the 40 years I was in the, in the Navy, perhaps once or twice in the Caribbean, we send out a ship to help out the islands after a hurricane. In the last five years, it has happened four times that we had to operate together with the French and the, and the, and the British Navy to help a string of islands in the Caribbean who were hit by hurricanes one year after the other. So it is increasing. Uh, and, and I think that is one of the main um, tasks of the military to be ready not just for crisis response operations, but also very early to respond and perhaps prepare for uh, extreme weather uh, and, and disasters. And then the third thing I want to mention is that, uh, and we had a previous speaker, Chris, who was, who is far better in seeking opportunities for business to grow and whatever. But but I do feel that the military, generally worldwide, have large budgets to spend, uh, and if we can seek cooperation with industry uh, and to to help out as testbed or launching customer uh, uh, seeking green technologies or uh, sustainable technologies it will not only give us operational advantage but we also will be able to support um, uh, industry our nations to bring forward uh, technologies that uh, will be for the better so those are the three things so uh, the, the intelligence reports, uh, be ready for uh, missions that we're being asked to do, and also help out 
investing in green technologies. Fantastic, thank you. And just a reminder to our audience to please pose any questions to our panelists and direct them to any one panelist in particular. Or if you have a question generally, please indicate that as well in the ask a question box underneath the video for this. So feel free to get your questions in early and we'll be getting to them with the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes of the session. So I will pose a question to Ben to ponder while we move to Cheryl, but I'd love to know more about the relationship between the military and civil society as well. What is it that the military contribute to more the challenges that civil society is facing? So that relationship between military installations and the community more broadly, would love for your thoughts on that, but we'll come back to you on that so I don't just throw that at you. Um, but in the meantime, Cheryl, if we could move to you, the question that we're curious about, given your, your um, expertise is, what is it that we're not really paying attention to regarding global security and trade tensions? So all these nations need to come together and, and act on climate. And so we need to put some practical measures in place to enhance the, the cooperation. But that, that doesn't mean that we're having any less sort of security and trade tensions. How do we begin to think about that and reconcile that? Yeah, so thanks, Sweater, and it's it's really the, the, the classic catch-22 challenge we, we face at the moment where we've heard constantly today about the need to collaborate. It's a global challenge and, and needs global collaboration. Yet probably the security tensions globally are the worst in, in certainly my 30 years in defence. We're, we're ratcheting up again the rhetoric and we're ratcheting up again the, the competition between nations. So... How do we, t we turn that around and, and move forward to a place where we can all start to um, collaborate and solve, solve the problem we have in front of us? I guess one of the, the key things for me is we've done this before. So it's not a situation of no hope. We've, for those who are old and grey like myself, uh, we may remember, or as, as kids we may remember, that the planet's come to a, a really nasty place, potentially of nuclear conflict. Uh, sort of 50, 60 years ago, 40 years ago. And at that time, the, the nations of the world managed to get together and, uh, and avoid a nuclear confrontation, which, which the nuclear scientists had put us two minutes to midnight, so pretty close to disaster. So I think there are some lessons in the past that we, we can bring forward to the future. And it's the importance of multilateral dialogue, and I, th I think Ben touched on this as well. So basically, every opportunity we have to get together and talk, I think, is moving us forward and, and dampening down those potential tensions. So I congratulate the Biden administration for the action that President Biden took in, in bringing world leaders together and having a discussion about climate change. That's a really good first step, but it needs to be much broader and, and much deeper and at every level. So every opportunity to talk across nations and talk across silos and talk across uh, groups of people needs to be taken. And one of the things I'm, I'm really encouraged by is actually at the, the subnational level, there are a number of great initiatives which are connecting uh, cities across the world and, and Rockefeller uh, C40 cities might be one that um, people are familiar with in America. But there's lots of sub, is it, there's sort of these groups of indigenous people globally connecting to each other and, and sharing ideas on how to, how to solve on climate change. So one of the suggestions is just look around you in your, in your own communities and say, is, is there a group that I identify with? And, and whether it's sport, it might be there, there are groups of, of farmers across the planet sharing ideas on, on how to solve agricultural challenges and sharing learnings from one country to another. I'm in, involved in a project where farmers in England, Nepal and Democratic Republic of Congo are sharing their experiences of changing food systems to help adapt to climate change. So actually, there's, there's heaps out there if you look at it. So, so I think the challenge is it's urgent now. We, we can't afford to, to keep talking about it. We've got to act. So look around and find that action that, that people can take in their own space. And the other thing about uh, is, is you, you've got to get rid of this name calling and, and, and this othering. Uh, Australia, like America, with this really strong uh, di political divide, which makes it very hard to have a conversation about climate change. And, 
often it's it's like you know it's sort of like it's an argument between two people it's nag 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 and, and tensions just escalate and go up so you've got to take every opportunity to, to de-escalate and, and de-escalate those tensions so all the, the name calling and the othering and the bad guys good guys language is just not really terribly useful at the moment if we accept that this is really a threat that requires the whole of the planet to solve any action that's against that so any action that's ratcheting up tensions or you know Put pushing people away so you're not part of the solution. And I, I was, I like to, I'm a, I'm a fisherman as, as well, a fisherwoman. Um, so there, there's opportunities to engage. So just look for them. So, so don't focus on the bad, look at the opportunities. And there's heaps of opportunities. So I think just leave, leave with that thing. Sometimes we can be too negative. It is a scary thing, climate change, but we just look at opportunities. And there in the military and diplomatic community, we've got some experience on this. So we're, we're actually quite good at doing uh, multinational uh, dialogues and conventions and, and COVID's made it hard, but we just need to do more of what you're doing here and have conversations where people from different places can come to a safe space and talk about the issues. Thank you so much for sharing that, Cheryl. That's music to my ears. As a behavioral scientist, I actually study why we have that resistance cognitively to new information that could really be helpful to adapting and to mitigating against those worst case scenarios of climate change and why those barriers, those cognitive barriers vary across demographics. And so as communicators and as those who are looking to collaborate and to actually incite some proactive preparedness and mobilization and action in different recipient groups of these messages, we need to make sure we tailor the messages so that they overcome any sort of resistance or hostility. So it, you, the nail on the head with what you said in terms of being compassionate and really identifying people for their shared values and building on that as opposed to othering people and to you know leading with our differences or trying to hammer through information. It's really about finding that common ground and building from there. So I really appreciate what you shared with the audience. Again, to the audience, please feel free to ask any probing questions or if there is a thread that has been put forward that we would you would like us to delve deeper into, please do not hesitate to raise that in the chat. Um, and we'll go to Jane with the next question. So Jane, how did you develop a framework to capture the different work that defense has been doing on climate change and how is it working to improve preparedness? We'd love to love for you to share your thoughts. Thank you very much for asking um, this question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had quite the challenge to address. We, we had, we essentially needed a way to categorize 10 recommendations that we were asked to um, progress work on. And we had to do this in a way that helpfully enabled different parts of our organizations to continue to build on the good work they were already doing or to start new work in new areas. Um, we thought about many different models um, that could enable us to do this. Um, in the end, after, of course, collaboration and consultation with um, other good minds, including some of our, our local, local scientists that we're very lucky to have here in Wellington at universities, um, as well as um, our other government departments. As I think Ben already mentioned, defense is not necessarily a lead on climate change but it does play an important part in supporting an all of government effort. Um, so the four categories we came up with um, to help progress work were respond, adapt, mitigate, and engage. And the, how we worked these four categories was to um, workshop 2030 goals. So thinking towards at the time, just past a decade, what is it that the organizations wanted to achieve in relation to climate change um, under these four pillars um, by the time somebody picks this up in 2030. For example, for Respond, um, by 2030, the aim is to be prepared to sustain multiple, con multiple concurrent complex operations in response to climate change. We're already seeing this a lot in our region. For example, bushfire season and cy tropical cyclone season are increasingly crossing over to each other. So different agencies that have a response role will need to be more prepared to be able to, to address these challenges at the same time. For ADAPT, we have the aim is to be continuously adapting to operate effectively in an environment that we know is going to be impacted by climate change. 
um, as defense forces around the globe go and operate in different theaters, they will be encountering communities that will a, also have um, strong indigenous knowledge that we can learn from them on how they've been adapting over time, but also we'll have to be mindful. Um, increasingly, communities will be under more stress um, testing resilience levels as the impacts of climate change do indeed worsen. There's also a role for defense to mitigate the impacts. So the aim by 2030 is to um, have reduced the impact on the climate and the wider natural environment. And there, that might seem like a daunting task for defense forces, but there are really crafty ways out there globally that forces have began to do this. Um, for example, the use of more electric vehicles um, is, a, is a really good example or installing, installing solar panels, for example, um, on camps and bases. Um, there's many different ways that, that countries have got into this, including New Zealand. And finally, for Engage by 2030, we hope that we are a trusted partner on climate change and security in the Pacific and internationally. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there to um, potentially go into some of the collaboration aspects of this um, in the next round of, of discussions. Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. That tees up well for the next round of questions. Um, and I threw an additional one at Ben uh, in the previous round. So I'd love for him to provide his thoughts on that. Really the relationship between the military and civil society and the military installations within the community that the installations are operating in, that relationship and how that can really be um, taken advantage of in a way that's mutually beneficial. And then more broadly, what is it that the military needs to do? So we've been talking about what can the military contribute, but what must the military do? Would love your thoughts there, Ben. Yeah, and I think they they flow into each other. So, so uh, to build up from what Jane said, I. Um, if you accept as the military that we will have some 20, 30 years still fossil fuel burning ships, aircraft and vehicles around, uh, and perhaps the latter is the most, uh, has the most opportunity to be replaced by something else, but ships and aircraft for some time will need fossil fuel, we must find ways as the military to offset that use, using perhaps making our bases and camps and barracks uh, net providers uh, of energy. But if you do that, uh, you must be able to give that in, that energy to someone else. Probably the communities around the naval bases and the air stations and the army barracks. So you, you must find this new way of cooperation. And uh, perhaps uh, not many people know that, but the oldest government bodies in the Netherlands are the so-called water boards. They're over a thousand years old. since, And they, they have existed uh, and started uh, well over a thousand years ago to keep the water out. Um, that we must build the same system in the Netherlands to look at our energy problem and now make sure that the whole community, everybody, uses the energy that is available and produced by everybody. Uh, and that will be a major challenge in which I think the military can play a, a substantial role, not just by being a, a partner, but also by stimulating research and using their investment budgets to help out uh, the areas that need to be helped out. So. That is, I think, where the, where the, the, the at, at, at our home basis, we can really help out and work together with the, uh, the people around us. If, is, is that what you were looking for? Yeah, no, that's, that's very valuable information. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then uh, what, we, uh, what the military has to do, um, well, we've, I can be, the first one we've touched upon already, and Jane mentioned as well, we need to increase our resilience. As I said, the Netherlands, my country is one third below sea level. So we, we've been fighting water for all our lives. Uh, but we keep, have to keep on fighting and fighting and fighting, make the dikes higher every year. But there's an end to that. So we, we must also start thinking more creatively about, uh, about other issues. So, so that is one thing. Um, uh, the second thing is um, uh, making sure that we, wherever it's possible, we become providers of energy. That is an important one. Uh, but most importantly, I think we need to prepare our armed forces uh, to be ready to... Uh, we are basically a crisis response force, but as most crises will be, will be instigated by, uh, by climate change, 
we must also climatize, climate adapt our forces by changing doctrines, by perhaps looking at other uh, equipment. Uh, just as a simple example, everybody knows what a submarine is, but the size of the submarine is often determined by the, the size of the ballast tanks needed to get the thing underwater and up again. Um, that, that depends, the size of that ballast tank depends on the salinity and the temperature of the water. If you still want your submarines to operate in warm waters with high salinity and, and cold waters with very low salinity, your submarine needs to become very, very big. So, so we need to think about uh, the, the technological, um, uh, the operational consequences of climate change and how it must affect our new equipment. But also, uh, I would say, train our people better, even better, in preparing themselves for operations under extreme weather conditions. So there's there's a wealth of, of things that the, the the military needs to do in order to prepare themselves for the, the missions that will be at hand and also become a responsible and a resilient operator in the field at the same time. And a question came from the audience before we come to Cheryl that really, I believe you're touching upon as you speak. So I would just ask, to, for you to um, give a little bit more, if there is more, on how naval vessels are planning to reduce their fossil fuel usage beyond their current nuclear powered ships. So if you have any further thoughts on that, that came from our audience. Yeah, um, uh, that's a good one. Um, um, and at the moment, uh, I think if a num quite a number of, of navies are thinking about replacing ships. Uh, and although there are alternatives like uh, hydrogen propulsion, et cetera, uh, certainly for small ships, that's an option. For the bigger ships, the frigates, destroyers, it is not yet an option. For my country, it would not be an option to go to nuclear-powered vessels. Um, that would be far too expensive. Um, so we're looking at other ways. But I must say that um, uh, uh, recently the, the Navy, uh, the maritime industry in the Netherlands, and the research establishments in the Netherlands have come together. Uh, they have been t working together for a long time. It, they were dubbed the Golden Triangle, which is always a dangerous name to use. But it was a sort of an uh, a, a knowledge engine. And we're using that now um, by, uh, and, and the, aim, the ambition is to produce a, f uh, a fossil fuel-free fuel energy train on board a ship uh, by the year 2040. Uh, and that's quite a challenge. But all these institutions now coming together with the Navy playing a role as providing information, acting as testbed, and perhaps in the future launching customer to allow the others to do their work and come up with a solution as quickly as possible. So that is a program that started recently. So the solution is not here yet, uh, but certainly the, 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 the consciousness that we must work on it is there, and a program has been set into, play, into motion. Excellent. Thank you, Ben, for giving us that update on the snapshot of where things are. Um, so Cheryl, Let's, let's talk a little bit more about some of the barriers that we discussed previously, which is not just political will, some communication challenges, overcoming resistance to action, whatever those might be. But beyond that, what, uh, what needs to be overcome really to make cooperation possible? I mean, I think one of the, the, the key things is trust. And I'll, I'll just share a story and it's sometimes we, we need to learn from the past. About just over 20 years ago, Australia almost came into conflict with our, our near neighbour, Indonesia, over the freedom of uh, East Timor or Timor-Leste. And part of the lessons learned from that was one of the reasons we didn't actually slide into conflict was that we'd had a program of cooperation between Australian and Indonesian military forces that had been running for five to ten years before that. So our Chief of Defence Force at the time personally knew the Chief of the Indonesian Defence Force and he got on the phone and said, hey, um, you know, this is not something we want to go to war in and just uh, we can work this out. And also the officer who was on the ground when there was a potential force-on-force uh, -force conflict at the border because uh, the two platoon commanders had different maps and the border was shown in different spaces, he also knew his Indonesian counterpart who, who was in the platoon at the other side of the border. So by personal knowledge and, and respect and, and trust, uh, conflict was averted. And I think the same things can happen now. So 
if we are regularly doing business with each other, and I'm talking now specifically about militaries, if we're working with each other, we, we tend to, to have more comfortable relations. We have a little bit more trust. And this can be quite difficult, and, and, and China is, is the big one. And I, I pose this question to a group of uh, students from Southeast Asian nations, from Vietnam, uh, Laos, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, and Malaysia recently, and sort of, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, we, we sort of know what we do. We don't, don't really trust China to do it. They had an issue of trust. And they identified some solutions and similar solutions. They said, well, what, perhaps we could work together on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. I mean, it's something militaries are called upon to do more and more and more. All militaries are doing it and have capabilities in this space. And militaries could cooperate in this space with, with sort of less risk. It's, it's not as risky as some of the other things that we may not want to expose technologies or we're concerned about intelligence collection. So let's start with things we can do. And one of the things we can do, I think, in the militaries is, is look at really how militaries, rather than individually respond to, to humanitarian crises, which are becoming bigger and bigger, and putting stress on militaries is, is can we do this sort of at a global scale? And I have in my mind, as a fan of the Thunderbirds, that perhaps we need something like uh, international rescue. So a challenge to the UN there is, is can we start bringing the militaries of the, of the world together? The Russians need to be in the camp with the Indians and the Chinese and the Americans and the Australians and, and sort of beef up from what we currently have in the, in the UN, but also at the same time, we, we now start to have conversations between countries that are currently, and perhaps rightly, a little bit lacking in trust with each other and, and just start to sort of open up that trust a bit better. That actually feeds well into a question that came in from the audience as well. What, um, how can we actually use climate collaboration to improve the security relationship with China? So what you just said, but just curious if you have some further insights with that. Well, I guess I've always reflected and encouraged and also discouraged simultaneously at individual levels, we tend to come together in a crisis. Our experience in Australia is when we've had the bushfires and we've had the floods you turn to your neighbour and you ask them, are you OK? You know, can I help out? And this is quite natural behaviour that at, at community and locals and individual levels we do. And you even help out your grumpy old neighbour who you may not particularly like, but if, if they're an elderly couple and there's been a flood come through, you go around and knock on their door and, and see if they're OK and have they got some food and water and, and, and could you help them out? Somehow at an international level, we don't do that. We do almost the complete opposite thing. So I think it's sort of particularly with China, as, as we interpret their actions, is to ask ourselves, is China OK? Well, are you OK? They've got massive food and water and security problems. So a lot of the actions that seem aggressive from our perspective are really just like, you know, a nation looking after its own people. And I think it's that, that empathy and to understand that we all, as humans, we're one species. We sort of all act mostly the same way. We have similar drivers. We all love our children. Um, we all want the, the best for the future. And again, it's it's the the sort of let's you know, be a bit respectful of, of of other nations' actions. Often they're not the the nastiness they're portrayed to be. They're actually sort of a nation trying to try to feed its people and trying to have a future for its children. So I think it's it's that understanding as well that's really important. But but just like like in every other collaboration, it sort of gets get together. There's some brilliant minds in China. Um, and one of the, the sad things I see at the moment in Australia is we're, we're closing uh, university and academic links with China because we're, we're afraid of um, intelligence. But we just need every solution on the table now. So instead of just closing off links, we need to be bringing more people together to try and come forward with you know, new ways of, of regulating international relations. So perhaps we can learn something about from how we dealt with nuclear tension. So we don't want to be doing that in isolation at a national level. So we've heard about got to collaborate in communities, got to collaborate across business sectors, got to collaborate at nations, also got to collaborate internationally. And so just as we're with COVID are sort of going back behind our own boundaries and, and sort of bunkering down, we now need to come out and look out. And if I, if I may, if I may yes. add to that, is that, and I don't want to bore you with my salty Somalia stories, but, uh, but in, that, in my time there, I, had, I was fortunate uh, enough to visit the Chinese flagship of the Chinese task group operating there three times. And, and um, so the examples are there that we are able, even able to cooperate, even with people that we 
are almost calling adversaries or strategic competitors, or whatever name we give it. But the examples are there that we do that we have operated together when we felt that the issue was a, a shared issue that we both had in common. Uh, and and I and if there's one issue that I feel the whole world has in common, it's it's climate change. So if perhaps worldwide it's too much, then then at least. Uh, identify the areas where you do want to cooperate. And I, as I said, the, the examples are there. So, so let's see if we can use that. And I honestly feel then, that's my own experience, that military diplomacy often helps. If you have a general or an admiral of, of one nation talking to another, there is very early on a common sense of understanding because you come from the same background. And if both are then feeding their reports back up to the political chain, it may well help. And if not, at least it's, it's worth a try. Yes, no, thank you to both of you. That's just beautifully put. We really do have to remember that we have more in common than not. We have a common humanity and a common shared planet, first and foremost. So thank you for putting those words forward and really leading with this idea of compassion and collaboration, because ultimately that is what is going to defeat the common enemy that we have in climate change. So I will move to Jane, and then we have a thoughtful question from Lucas Haynes um, from the audience that I'll put forward to the panel as well. But first, Jane, can you please talk to us a little bit about how ENGAGE is a key pillar of the New Zealand implementation plan, and how do you balance the various levels of cooperation? And give us some real sort of examples of how this is working in a COVID-19 world. Thank you. And, and, and for the interest of time, I'd, I'd like to continue on the, the Indo-Pacific focus of, of a, a bit of this conversation. Um, and a really key example of collaboration and cooperation um, across civil military lines um, is the Pacific Environmental Security Forum. Um, New Zealand is a key partner of this forum, which is actually led by the, the US Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. In, in 2019, New Zealand had the pleasure of hosting the, the in-person forum, which convened um, over 120 representatives from 40 plus Indo-Pacific countries and civil society organizations all came together to, to learn and discuss the security impacts of climate change, issues around um, oceans and fisheries diversity, um, and the importance of cohesive civilian military partnerships. So, um, um, and in particular, um, as has already been mentioned um, in regards to humanitarian assistance and disaster um, coordination, um, the group even gets into more um, supportive activities around oil spill response um, and environmental conservation, really being able to bring in other departments. For example, our Department of Conservation was able to share some interesting stories um, to the group. Um, this organization, I think, is really unique. Um, countries can choose what kinds of departments they bring to the table. So in, in most cases, it's a military representative, but in some cases, it might be ministries for the environment or foreign affairs and trade. Um, and really a huge, huge representation from across the wider region. Um, give, waiting a little bit for COVID to see how it would pass last year. Um, in the, the US Indo-PACOM hosted a very successful virtual conference this February. Um, and a similar amount of um, participants actually tuned in online, which was really fantastic. Um, and the, the opportunity here to share experiences across the civil military lines. Um, we, New Zealand gave a um, collaborative presentation with our French counterparts as an example on, on how you could start a policy process from scratch um, and the feedback we had on that including from learnings from the other agencies found it interesting just to hear the learnings um, was really good um, and for example those on the policy side of the house found it really um, helpful to hear how um, operational um, groups had been working with departments of conservation groups on the ground um, but forums like this um, and at the regional level um, really bring a good range of countries together. And as I think Cheryl's already alluded to, there is much more we can all learn from each other 
um, to do better on this topic. Um, and so, yeah, the more collaboration going forward um, can only be a good thing amongst all, all different nations. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Okay, we, d we only have a few minutes left in this panel, which is unfortunate because we're really making some headway in the importance of proactive preparedness and collaboration and, and just the global nature of this panel is, is a great microcosm for what we really need in the real world. So a question from Lucas Haynes is, does, do any of the panelists here know um, if, there's a, if there is a study on global carbon footprint of defense ministries, is this another additional opportunity for cooperative mitigation? And let's say that we're able to reduce these footprints, couldn't it really lift up all the mitigation and cooperation security goals that we're, we're collectively trying to reach here? So if any of the panelists would like to share their thoughts there, please feel free. I think there is one. I, I can't lay my hands on it immediately, but uh, I know the figures have been put up that are the defence forces of the planet combined are sort of up there with a sort of small, medium-sized country in terms of their, their carbon emissions. So it is big. So if militaries put their thoughts to, to reducing their footprint and, and solving um, uh, CO2 emissions, it, it does actually make a difference. But also, um, I think um, it just reinforces for me what the, the key solution is. The key solution is decarbonisation as quickly as possible because it's solving the problem at its source. All the other interventions, humanitarian assistance, peace building, conflict prevention, food and water security, are dealing with the um, symptoms rather than the cause. So I think it's it brings us back to focus at the... The rapid decarbonisation is the solution. I just also I'm happy to share with the uh, Netherlands Navy. Australia's just launched a, a, a solar, um, uh, remotely piloted uh, marine little small uh, collection vessel. So we haven't solved it for the big ships, but at least we're, we're getting there with our our own technologies. Thank you for that, Ben. Please also use this question to provide yeah. any final thoughts. Uh, I know that, uh, and I. I've left the service now uh, almost two years ago. So, but I, I believe just recently the Dutch Ministry of Defence promulgated um, uh, their energy strategy for the next years to come, uh, and that includes also looking at research that will enable us to become uh, more resilient uh, and a, a provider of energy as well. And I know the UK uh, Ministry of Defence has also produced something similar. So. Uh, I don't know the content on the top of my head, but I do know that that a number of militaries in Europe and perhaps also Australia and New Zealand are working on these strategies, on these on these policy documents that will that will kickstart sort of the, the change. Now, whether reducing our carbon footprint will then um, help to solve all the problems in the world, I don't know, because although climate change is not just a uh, 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 an instability driver. I think it's an instability accelerator, almost. Um, we can't, it's not just the only one. So if you, if you look at climate change at the moment, even if we stop reducing all carbon at the moment, there will still be effects. Uh, there will still be desertification in southern, south of the Sahel. There will still be growing populations there. So there will be security issues coming. Um, uh, but it will certainly help us to address those things better if we become uh, more responsible actors. Thank you, Ben. Well, we've reached the end of our session. Jane, if you have any final, just a few th words that you would like to share as we close out the session, please. Um, thank you, Fiesta. Um, nothing much further to add, just to say um, thank you to both the, both the panelists and to yourself as, as the convener and also to those um, organizing this this day and um wish all the all the future panels um well for the rest of your conference thank you very much well thank you thank you jane thank you cheryl thank you ben for the work that you do and your expertise and for taking the time to contribute and to share with this audience today thank you all very much and uh all the best for the rest of the today's conference back to you nathan